morning. Three, two, one. I'm glad you're here this morning to worship with us, uh, whether you're here in person or uh, on Facebook or whenever you may be watching us. We're just thankful to have you here uh, this morning as part of our worship experience. And we always love to begin with just uh, giving praise to God. So that's what we'll do this morning. Uh, so let's stand, let's sing, let's give praise to Him. We're sinners, the river's just ahead. Down the path of forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You build a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, it's here to lift you high. And if you lost and wondering, come stumbling in like a prodigal. Have a seat. Thank you all. Uh, a couple of things this morning just want to make you aware of uh, during our announcement time. One is it is Pentecost Sunday, uh, and because we're in the middle of the Second Corinthians thing, you won't get a uh, Pentecost sermon uh, as such uh, this morning. Uh, but I do hope that you'll maybe sometime this week go back and read the second chapter of Acts. Uh, we call Pentecost the birthday of the church. Uh, and what happened there on that particular day in Acts chapter 2 uh, is uh, in, the, in the filling of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, just really uh, dramatically changed the direction of, of the church that uh, we're able to celebrate today. So take some time this week, read Acts chapter 2, and you'll get a feel for why we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. Uh, Bethlehem House this week, uh, on Thursday, I'll take the food down there. We're still not allowed to go in and serve, which I really miss, but uh, hopefully in the next few months, maybe we'll be able to go in and actually serve there. Uh, and interact with the people, but I'll take the food down there this Thursday, have it here at the church at 5 o'clock, uh, and I still need probably uh, a casserole and maybe a couple side dishes, so if you can help out with that, that would be fantastic. Uh, you can make a comment on Facebook, you can send me an email or a text, or just tell me after church. Uh, and then uh, Wednesday night activities uh, are up and running, so uh, just make sure you uh, take a look at that. We've got some for adults, children, youth on Wednesday night. Uh, over the next couple weeks. And then uh, this, uh, we've got the UMW here this morning that wants to present. We've got a couple of our seniors, I think, here with us this morning, and, and uh, a couple of them are out on a senior girls' trip or something, I think, aren't they? Uh, and that's fine. We want them to be able to celebrate that. So uh, the UMW, I know, uh, Allie, you're here, and Landon's here. 
right? Landon, are you here? Are you here, Landon? <laughs> Landon, by the way, you all, is, 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 Casey is coming. This is his 18th birthday today. Uh, so now we're, I said, well, what's, what's the difference? Landon and, and Michael, who knows all these legal facts and stuff, said, because Landon is 18 today, he can now transport more than two people. Is that right? Two, two people in his car. Uh, he's released from that restriction. So any of y'all that want to ride home today, uh, just hit up Landon because he can get, how many can you get in your vehicle? Five in your vehicle. So, so you can get four other people. Okay, so Land will be glad for, to take four of you home. Uh, he can legally do that now. Uh, and, and do you feel free? I guess so. <laughs> oh, Landon, we have such marvelous personalities up here, don't we? Marvelous. I guess so. <laughs> hey, I'm, I, I love these kids. Uh, go ahead, Casey. And we'll handle the rest of them. Get back up there and play. Uh, we'll handle the rest of them when, when, uh, one by one when we, when we get them here. Uh, I am thrilled to have you here this morning. Worship me if you brought an offering this morning. Offering plates are in the back. We're continuing to be a little bit COVID compliant here. Uh, so we're not passing the plates or allowing you to come forward. But the plates are in the back. And I appreciate your giving, your continued support uh, to the church this morning. Uh, so let's stand. Let's sing. Let's continue to give praise to God. Thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm called in your grace everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all. Let 
Let justice and praise become my embrace. Consume me from the inside out. prayer list this morning is there in, uh, in your bulletin, if you've got the bulletin this morning, and just a couple of things uh, I want to add to it. Uh, one is uh, if you uh, keep in your prayers this week, the Careway United Methodist Church, they had a fire there this week, uh, early, early this week, and really uh, destroyed the, the interior of that building. I think the outer structure is still there, uh, but they're going to be worshiping outside and doing some other things, but keep that congregation in your prayers, if you would. Caraway United Methodist Church. Uh, they had insurance uh, and that's going to cover, I think, the repairs, but we want to certainly lift up that congregation. Uh, and then add this name, and you can spell it however you want to spell it, Glenna Palmasano. Uh, Glenna and Bill are, are part of my church in BB, Arkansas, uh, and I just love Bill and Glenna. And uh, Glenna uh, coded uh, the other night, uh, and they've Med flighted her to, got, brought her back, but med flighted her to uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Little Rock, and that's where Glenna is now. If you'll pray for her, uh, she uh, has COVID. She's uh, on uh, a vent right now. They're reducing the oxygen with her. Uh, she's a good bit younger than I am, if I remember correctly. Uh, but uh, keep Glenna in your prayers and Bill, just wonderful Christian people that we love dearly, and I know that they would appreciate uh, your prayers. I'll keep you informed. And just a kind of a reminder to us that this COVID thing is not over yet. We need to practice social distancing. We need to, uh, you know, just, just be careful as we release the restrictions. We still need to kind of uh, stay clear and, and, you know, practice the things we need to practice, good hygiene and hand washing and stuff like that. So it's a reminder, but keep Glenna in your prayers. Uh, I'll give you an update every week on Josh and Kayla, my son and daughter-in-law, expecting twins. They've set the date for a C-section on June the 1st. So if she hasn't delivered in the next uh, few days, the next, what is it, 10 days maybe, uh, they'll bring those little twins into the world on June the 1st. So I'd ask your continued prayers every day that those little twins stay in there. It's just they get a little bit healthier, uh, and we're thankful for that. Uh, but please just remember them in your prayers. How many of y'all saw Josh on TV this week, by the way? Some of y'all saw Josh on TV. My son Josh was on TV. Uh, and not for anything really spectacular or extraordinary that he did, but there was a little flooding on their street in Little Rock, and so they interviewed Josh about that. I'm proud of my son, you know. I, <laughs> proud of all my kids. But anyway, uh, uh, if you want to uh, watch that video, I've got it, and I'll clip it and send it to you all. It's, uh, uh, keep the Linderman family in your prayers, if you would, in the passing of... of Jim, Reverend Jim Linderman, a Central Church in Rogers. Keep that church in your prayers. Uh, and Jim's wife, Beth, and his two sons in your prayers, if you would. Uh, and uh, then it, always, if you've got prayer needs, prayer requests, cards are in the back. I encourage you to always fill those out. Let me know how I can pray for you uh, and what needs are in your family. I, I take that as a very uh, important uh, responsibility, but also a great joy to lift up the needs in your life uh, each day. Uh, this morning, we're gonna, uh, the praise band is going to sing If I Can Only Imagine. Uh, use this as a time, whether you're here, whether you're at home, uh, wherever you are, use this as a time of personal prayer for you. I 
I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. But I can only imagine. got your Bibles, you can turn to uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be in chapters 8 and 9 uh, this morning. Uh, I know it's Pentecost Sunday, but uh, like I said, you all can go home and read uh, the second chapter of Acts and get a good idea of uh, why we celebrate what we celebrate in the, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that day. Uh, if you would, bow your heads, pray for me as I pray for you. Loving God, open our hearts and our minds so that we can receive what your word is for us today. You know what we need to hear and what brought us here this morning. So use this time, Lord, to glorify you. The words that are spoken, the songs that we've heard, the things, Lord, that you're going to place in our heart over the next few minutes. Convict us, challenge us, annoy us, comfort us through the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit and through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Uh, we've been uh, 
trying to be undeterred, haven't we? It's our study of 2 Corinthians, uh, how to remain undeterred through all of the challenges in life. We began this year, if you remember, with uh, Galatians 5, uh, looking at the fruits of the Spirit. Do you all remember that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That was our memory verse, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I know you all still run that through your mind uh, every so often. Uh, and to remain in the Spirit and to allow the Spirit to, uh, to grow those fruits in our life, we, uh, life throws us so many different challenges. I, I think it is important for us to look at how do we remain uh, that faithful? How do we allow the Spirit to continue to work in our life? And that's part of what 2 Corinthians is study that we're going through, how to remain undeterred in our faith uh, and to be people of faith and people of the Spirit. Throughout all that, that life brings in our way, uh, we have our memory verse for this series that we've been working on. It is 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, right? 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9. Y'all have been working hard to memorize this, correct? Correct? Yes, yeah, sure you have. Uh, I know, I know you have, and, and, and I know that like last time I offered the kids $20, and some of you adults, if they would memorize it during the course of the series, we have some of the $20 winners here with us today uh, that memorize Galatians 5, 22, and 23, and I probably, if I offered uh, you adults $20, you might work a little bit harder, right? Am I going to do that? No, no. Uh, I expect you to just do this out of what it, the benefit that it's going to bring to your life uh, over the course of the next uh, few months, years, and throughout your lifetime. So this is 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9. You ready to say it together? I've left out a few more. Uh, I put in a few more blanks in there. So you ready? I know it's at the top of your sheets there, but don't look at your sheet. Uh, let's, let's do it together. Let's read it together. We are hard-pressed on every side. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Good. You're getting, you're getting there. Uh, and I'll cut out a few more words next time. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. And struck down, but not destroyed. That's where we are. So I want to begin this morning with a quote from a book uh, from a researcher, Laura Sumner Truex. She wrote a book, Love Let Go. And in the very beginning of her book, a uh, fascinating book. Uh, she began the book with these words that I want to share with you this morning. She writes, all of us have a supernatural power. Isn't that great to know? We have a supernatural power capable of improving almost every aspect of our lives. We flourish when we use this power, and those around us flourish as well. When we use this power, studies show we have increased energy and happiness. And then she goes on to say, these results are as conclusive as the link between exercise and health. But equally amazing is that most of us simply don't believe it. And so she asks, what is this superpower? And the answer, generosity. So this morning, we're going to talk about the superpower of generosity. Uh, and the classic biblical passage for this is 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Uh, today, I'm not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse thing because it would take us way too long. We dig a little bit deeper, as I mentioned from time to time, on Wednesday night. Uh, so we're going to hit some key verses this morning, and I hope these key verses will really uh, encourage you in your walk with Christ and how to remain undeterred in your faith. Um, the, I want to give you a little historical context first this morning, which is so important to understand what we're talking about today. Uh, the Christian movement, of course, was, was started by Jewish people in Jerusalem. Uh, then more and more non-Jews, what we know as Gentiles, became Christians. Uh, and uh, there was this between the Gentiles and the Jews who became Christian. There was this tension between them, between the Jewish and the Gentile Christians. Uh, there was doctrinal tension, there was ethnic tension, there was political tension. Uh, they just did not mesh well together. Uh, the, uh, the Jews, understandably, especially between the Jews and the Roman Gentiles, uh, because the Jews understandably saw the Romans as part of the problem. Uh, and they, uh, you know, the Jews were part of that oppressive system that was constantly trying to hold down uh, the Christians and the Jews, and, and, and they, they, didn't, they didn't like the Roman Gentiles especially. Because the Roman Gentiles, they would, they would eat things like eels and shrimp, uh, and they would get tattoos, uh, and that was, those were things were not kosher. 
in, in Jewish thought, you know, they're, they're just not. And so, uh, so they always, you know, looked uh, with kind of down upon uh, the Roman, even the Roman Christians, the Gentile Christians, because of some of those, uh, those issues. Uh, the most culturally Roman of all the cities back then in the empire was the city of Corinth. Uh, you can see where Corinth is located kind of in relationship with Jerusalem. Corinth is what, as we now know, is modern-day Greece. Uh, and even the other Romans saw uh, the Corinthians, I think I mentioned this last week, saw the Corinthians as especially pagan. Uh, those people living in, in Corinth, uh, they were well known. That city was well known for just being a city of spoiled brats uh, and self-indulgent rich people. Uh, so the people in Corinth especially were not looked on with favor, uh, especially by the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, and as well as some of the Roman Christians as well in other parts. Uh, so when the Jewish Christian believers, uh, very conservative people, they hear that there are people in Corinth that decide to be part of their movement, the Christian faith, uh, they are, I would say, at least skeptical. Uh, that's being kind. Uh, there is tension there, uh, and they did not want to recognize uh, the movement of the Spirit that was really happening. The Jews in Jerusalem did not want to recognize the movement of the Spirit that was happening there in Corinth. So there was this, this tension between the two, the two places, the two early Christian groups. Uh, and, and so when something then terrible happened. There was this bad famine uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, people were starving, not getting enough to eat. Uh, money was scarce. And so the Apostle Paul decided that he would go to the Gentile churches in Corinth. He would go there uh, and try to kind of have a food drive as well as raise money uh, for the people down in Jerusalem, for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, he literally went church to church to try to raise money in Corinth for the people down in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and not really just to feed the Jerusalem Jews. He really, his, I think his main idea, he, Paul saw this as a great opportunity for reconciliation between the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem uh, and the Gentile Christians in Corinth. Uh, and so, so how, does he, how does he bring these two groups together? What does Paul say to actually motivate the Corinthians, the Christians there in Corinth, to motivate them to give this special offering uh, to the to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. What I want you to notice over the next few verses, I want you to notice there is not the motivation, not one ounce of guilt is used. Not one, one ounce of guilt. Uh, this is 100% positive how Paul approaches uh, those Christians in Corinth. Uh, you're going to love this. Paul says to live a generous life, a life of generosity, to be, to be known as a generous person, uh, be inspired by three positive things. You've got those in your notes there. Uh, so either you can produce them online uh, or I hope you picked them up this morning in your bulletin. So number one in your notes this morning, I can be inspired to a life of powerful generosity when I see uh, the positive examples of giving all around you. All the positive examples of giving around you. Uh, and Paul actually said so there's three ways, three positive examples of giving that I want you to look at. Uh, so under that number one. One, he says, um, the positive examples of other people in your area. Okay? Uh, look at 2 Corinthians 8.1. Uh, there in your notes, he says, uh, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches, the churches in Corinth. And we want you to know about this grace. He's telling his, the people there in Jerusalem. The word grace there keeps coming up again and again. We're very familiar as Christians with that word grace. Uh, ten times over the next two chapters, in chapters 8 and 9, ten times Paul talks about grace. Without a doubt, this is one of the most important words in, uh, to describe our faith. We miss this sometimes as Christians because our faith seems to be, we try to motivate people by guilt a lot of times, don't we, rather than by grace. Uh, I try to do that with you all. I've stopped doing that. I hope, uh, I hope I have. I really try to pull back. Sometimes I'll twist your arm to do something, uh, and I'll realize, no, they need to be motivated not by guilt. They need to be motivated by grace. Pull back and, and just preach on the grace, and don't try to beat them over the head. Sometimes, every once in a while, I still get out the big stick, and I still try to beat you to death with guilt. But I realize that is not the best way to motivate anybody, is it? The best way to motivate people is through love and through grace. Uh, our faith is all about grace. 
The grace is God's unmerited favor given to us. We do not deserve it. Uh, every breath we take, every sunrise we see, every sunset we have, uh, and the thousands of gifts of graces in between those two events every day uh, are like you know, the streaming of God's grace to us over and over and over again. The more we get that, the more we understand this is all God's grace, the more we live like that, uh, we're going to radiate grace to other people, uh, just like these Macedonians did. So watch what Paul says here. He says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now that is an interesting verse, isn't it? In the midst of their severe trial, uh, the people there in Corinth, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I've got a question. Do you know anybody that meets that description? That's a pretty awesome description, isn't it? Do you know anybody in your life, in, the pa- in your past or right now, who have both overwhelming joy, yet extreme poverty, and also richly generous? Those people are, are rare. Uh, I was trying to think of an example this week to give you, and the only thing I can really think of is I, I think of my mom and dad. Uh, we, we, I, I did not come from extreme poverty. I don't want you to think that, but uh, I think I'm, beg- I'm beginning to realize as I grew older that we were not as wealthy as what I thought we were growing up. Uh, I grew up in a cinder block house. Uh, in a little cinder block house in St. Albans, West Virginia, 2326 Harrison Avenue, St. Albans, West Virginia. You can get on Google. You can look up 2326. I thought we had a, a Harrison Avenue. We had a big yard. I thought we had a big yard when I was a kid. I thought our house was a mammoth house. But it was a little cinder block house. I got a thing I've told you all. I, went to go, I got to go into it a few years ago. Uh, I go home every so often, and whenever I go get LaRobie's Pizza, I always drive by Harrison Avenue, see our little house where I began. And it is, it's a little cinder block house. And when I went in it, I was amazed at how small our house was. We had one bathroom, get this kids, one bathroom at the end of the hall. Can you imagine having one bathroom in your house? We can't imagine that now. All of you all having to fend in one bathroom. Uh, But it was a nice little house, but we had a little living room. We didn't have like a family room. We had a little living room and a little kitchen with a little kitchenette there is where we ate. Uh, and it was, a, a, I'm just amazed at, at how small it was. Uh, but it was a, a loving home and a beautiful home. Uh, and what I remember most about it, I used to think that we had a big backyard as well. And when I w- went and looked at the backyard, it's just like little, tiny backyard. And as a small kid, you think, wow. But, but, but it was just a little backyard. So I don't want to say we're, we're in a poverty, but mom, mom told me once, they would tell me stories. Now that I'm an adult, they would say, you know, there was a time There was a week that we remember. We opened up the refrigerator, and all we had was hot dogs in there, and we wondered how we were going to make it the rest of the week. And I I said, Mom, no, we weren't like that. We weren't that. And she said, yes, there were were weeks like that. And I I said, we never knew that. Really? And she said, we never talked about it. We never, we knew God was going to provide, uh, that we would be all right, and God always provided. And I thought, oh, my gosh, because mom and dad, they were always, and still, mom still is the most generous person that I know. She, uh, and dad was the same way. Uh, if there was a need in the church uh, or if there was a family in need, mom would bake, uh, make a meal or bake some cookies or bake a pie or whatever, and she would take it to them. And I always thought, you know, they always have, and mom still has this overwhelming joy about her. It's going to be 90 in July, and she still has this overwhelming joy and is always looking at ways that she can be generous and help other people. Uh, and I know that. Uh, they taught us a lot. They taught us uh, that generosity is more of a mindset, uh, and it has nothing to do with our wealth. I got that I, from mom and dad. It's a, it's a mindset. It doesn't have anything to do with your bank account. Uh, it's an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. We always look at what we don't have rather than what we do. Uh, and I was thankful growing up uh, that our mindset was always look at what God has blessed us with, not what we don't have. And this is kind of exactly what these Macedonians... You probably got examples of people in your life like that. Uh, And this is exactly what these Macedonians, these people in in Corinth, believed here. And that's what Paul is saying. Guys, be inspired by the positive examples that are in your life. Be inspired by them. Uh, The second thing he says under that number one is think of the positive example of Jesus Christ. Uh, Skip to verse 9 there where he says... 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Jesus Christ was rich beyond our imagination, wasn't he? And yet he gave up all of that, all of that. Uh, he gave up that uh, to be born in basically a feeding trough. Uh, he died on the cross, condemned to death outside of the city walls out of his overwhelming love for you. That's what he did. No strings attached, just grace, just generosity being given to you. That's it. And we give because we understand that. We understand what Christ has done for us. That's why we give. And then finally, Paul says, also be inspired by the positive example of God's desire for equality. And I want to tread lightly here. But when we talk about equality now, uh, we, sometimes you hear different things. I want you to understand what, what Paul meant and what I mean. Uh, and this is so inspiring when you really look at it in the Scripture. You skip down a couple verses, look at verse 12. It says, give according to what you have, not what you don't have. That's the message translation. He's saying don't, God doesn't judge you because of what you have or what you don't have. Uh, we can't all you know, be generous in the same way. Uh, some right now are financially strapped and have had difficulty during the season of COVID, and, uh, and their schedules are different, and, and their giving of their time even, and trying to dig out from all of this is difficult. Others right now are in a pretty good spot, and, and, and you're in a place where you can be more generous with your time, with your talents, with your gifts, with your service. Uh, Paul says here in verse 13, Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so in turn, their plenty, their plenty will supply what you need. One day, you might be in a place of need, and they will come to your help and to your aid. Uh, he says the goal is equality. Equality. Now, let me tell you what Paul means by that. And let me give you a little bit of the context here. Uh, back in, in the Roman days, there was no such thing as the welfare system. You would never get a check from the government, so to speak. Uh, and not, uh, you had to be, you had to, if things were going bad in your life, you had to find what they called a patron. Okay? A patron. The Roman system of charity was this. Uh, the wealthy elite Romans would sometimes adopt uh, they would call them clients. They would adopt a client. Uh, this could be poor individuals or poor families or even a poor neighborhood uh, or a cause. Uh, they would become patrons for those clients. They would assist them financially. Uh, there, this was not a no-strings-attached agreement. The clients would now owe a series of favors or a series of social obligations to their wealthy patrons. Uh, it was kind of like, like the mafia. You know, the mafia would say, I do you a favor. You, I do you a solid. Uh, I, I wish, and, and, and you do me a solid one day. That's my best mafia. You can tell I've never spent any time in the mafia. Mitch does a good mafia. I should have had Mitch do the mafia for me this morning. Uh, but, but that's the best, I, best I've got for you. But, but Paul is saying to the Corinthians, it's not like that. This is a no-strings-attached thing. I, I don't want you to have a patron relationship uh, with the Gentile Christians up there in Corinth. This is not that because the Jewish people, remember, were already had some real obstacles to that because they were rebelling against this Roman system that was all into this, uh, that they hated. Uh, and they were going to see maybe this patronage of the Corinthian people helping them as a, kind of the same arrangement. You help me now, then later on we're going to call in a favor. Paul is saying you don't lure that over them. If you're going to help them, this is all about equality. You're exactly the same. This is, not, this is not some other system of oppression. This is equality. And we do have to be careful about this today. It's easy for us to get in a situation where even our generosity can, can develop toxic relationships. Uh, Paul is imagining a whole different way of generosity and giving uh, than what was being taught in Roman culture and what was being practiced here. Grace. He's saying just grace, no strings attached. If you're going to do this, there are no strings. You do this solely out of love for your brothers and sisters down in Jerusalem who are struggling. Now, I kind of understand this uh, because of you, and many of you all know I have a sister that's younger than me, 11 years younger than me. My sister, Tricia, who's been here on occasion, has always been subservient 
to me. She, because I'm the big brother, and what I say always goes. Some of y'all have those relationships in your family. It's big brother, but what big brother says is, is what, what you have to follow. It has always been that way with me and my sister. I wanted to take care of her. I wanted to watch over her. I've done that since she was, since she was born. I have been the caring, nurturing brother. Uh, and I still practice that with her today. Uh, I mean, when we go out to eat, it infuriates my wife. Uh, because although my sister is very successful, matter of fact, she makes more money than I make, uh, when it comes time to pay for the meal, I pay for the meal when my sister and I go out to eat. No ifs, ands, or buts. Sometimes Tricia will grab that, that receipt, grab the, the tab before I get it, and I say, you're not going to do that. Why? Because I'm the big brother. Uh, and that is our relationship. I take care of you, period. You don't take care. You're 11 years younger than me. You do not take care of me. We will argue, have literal arguments there around the table, my sister and I. It happens all the time. And finally, my wife will look at me and she'll say, stop it. Just stop it. Let her pay the bill. So I don't like it, but every so often I let my sister pay the bill. But that is not, uh, my sister and I need to have this patron-client relationship. I take care of her, and one day maybe I'm going to need her as I grow older. She's 11 years younger than me. I have it in my mind that one day I'm going to need her to take care of me. I'll be, you know, 95. She'll only be a spry 84. Uh, and I'm going to need her to pick up the... And so I'm thinking that in the back of my mind. I always say, you remember all those meals I bought for you? One day... But that's not the relationship Paul is talking about. He's not talking about this older brother, younger sister relationship. He said, you don't lord that over her. You are equal. You are equal in God's eyes. You don't owe her a thing. She doesn't owe you a thing. The, the Jeru people in Jerusalem will not owe you. No strings attached charity. It's all about grace. That is what Paul is saying. And there's, Paul is really trying hard to lean away from any guilt motivation. He's only looking at the positive example. He says, the positive, look at the positive examples of others. Look at the positive example of, of God's desire through Scripture for equality. Uh, and because, why, why do that? He says, because inspiration by example always, always more effective than guilt. Inspiration by example is always more effective than guilt. Guilt is a short-term solution. Uh, but sooner or later, that guilt will not, uh, will not motivate. Uh, that's what Paul is getting at. Inspiration by example, always more effective than guilt. Uh, I can prove that to you. Uh, three years ago, the Atlanta Boys and Girls Club made a video at Christmas. Uh, and I just saw it this past Christmas, but it was done three years ago. I've been waiting to use it on you, so to speak, at the right time. Uh, and I, what I want you to remember as you watch this video is about 85% of the kids who utilize the Atlanta Boys and Girls Club live, under, live in extreme poverty, what they call the, way below the poverty level. About 85 of these kids that you're going to see, 85% of them, uh, come from very low-income families. So with that in mind, I want you to watch this video. This year for Christmas, what are you hoping to get? A computer. Big, giant Barbie house. A trophy case. Xbox 360, Minecraft Legos. What do you think your mom or dad want for Christmas? My mom would probably want a ring. She's never really had a ring. Jewelry. She loves jewelry. A new TV. My watches. So, you actually did buy an Xbox 360. What in the world? What is this? Okay, you you really got this one? A new laptop. Wow. And it's a necklace. So we also bought a necklace because you said you also wanted to get a necklace for your mom or your auntie. The catch is that you can either get a gift for yourself huh? or you can pick a gift for your mom and dad. I need you to pick one. Now, now before you answer, oh, I bet that's hard. Is that a really hard question? Mm -hmm. What gift do you pick? A Jesus. I gotta go with the ring. What gift do you pick? That one. That one. 
The dress. I'll choose this for my mom. I'll choose this one. It's a really tough question. I'll but give him this. You already know? Tell me why. Because Legos don't matter. Lego, your family matters. Not Legos, not toys, your family. So it's either family or Legos, and I choose family. I get gifts every year from my family, and my mom don't get anything. If I get a laptop, my mom will get something. She helps me when I'm sick. She helps me with my homework. She gave me a house to live in. They look out for me and do stuff for me, so I need to give back to them. Now I have the opportunity to give them something. Because you actually picked the gift for your family, you're actually going to go home with both. Tell me how you're feeling. I'm feeling really happy and Why? thankful. Just happy. Thankful. For your family? For what? My family, everything. You did make his decision, actually. And he picked the Pandora charm. Oh, that is so You're gonna make me cry. So we can do it to you. In your room. Oh, it's for me? Oh, it's so cute. Thanks, guys. I'm coming to you. This kind of brings a little, when I watch this, it still kind of brings a little, a little tear to my eye. And that's what Paul, I mean, that's, uh, you know, we're, we're feeling exactly what Paul is getting at in this passage, to be motivated to live generously first. Uh, and, and you look at those positive examples of giving. Uh, and then second in your notes, have a positive understanding of giving. Flip over your notes there to the back side, a positive understanding uh, of the nature of giving. Uh, here's what I mean. It's, it's easy to think of giving as loss, but it is actually gain. I'm not losing my money. I'm not losing my time. Uh, it's gain. I'm investing. And this is what Paul is getting at there in chapter 9, verse 6, where he says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. He's talking here about this principle of sowing and reaping that you all know about. You reap what you sow, and you also reap more than you sow. Uh, I saw a picture on Facebook a couple weeks ago uh, of this 100-year-old rhododendron. Now, the rhododendron is the state flower uh, of West Virginia, my home state. Mother actually has a rhododendron bush out in her uh, backyard, out on her patio. It's a good-sized bush. Uh, and, and the woman there beside of that 100-year-old rhododendron uh, is the woman who planted it. She's 102 years old, and when she was a kid, her and her family planted just this little bush. Uh, and then over the past 100 years, it has just grown to this monstrosity. Uh, uh, she got way, back, got way more back than what she planted, didn't she? Uh, I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's, what, that's a great point is that you don't know the beauty that you're creating. 100 years from now, your generosity, uh, you know, you're giving grace and love and the generosity that you show to other people. It may be you don't know what, it's gonna, what kind of dividends it's going to have 100 years down the road. Uh, that this one seed, the one seed that you plant may just uh, erupt into a thousand blossoms uh, later on. So when you see life like that, this is how you give. Next verse, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Never let anyone tell you what to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Never give out of guilt. Never. Never give out of pressure. Uh, because God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I remember hearing this all growing up. Why does God love a cheerful giver, you all? Heard that in church all the time. He loves a cheerful giver because this is exactly who God is. God gives to each and every one of us joyfully, cheerfully. Uh, your salvation, the breath that you just took just a second ago, God cheerfully gave it to you. And it means that when we give cheerfully, we are becoming more and more like him. And that's his goal. Cheerful giving is literally the essence of who God is and the essence of who he wants us to become. And let's wrap this up with point three there in your notes, okay? Uh, you're going to love this because here's where Paul starts talking about positive examples. He talks about positive understanding of giving. And then in his third point, he just goes on this soaring emotional kind of cascade, this crescendo where he says, uh, be motivated by real positive expectation of giving. Uh, 
there are so many passages that have to do with this biblical idea and concept of reward. Uh, that God will reward you for your acts of generosity. Uh, and, and that's a whole different sermon series is to really look at the reward theology throughout the Bible. The Bible is full of those promises. And here Paul talks about it when he says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in, look at this, in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That just about sums everything up and covers everything, doesn't it? All things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Uh, and then he quotes an Old Testament Psalms. Uh, he says this, They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Paul is quoting their Psalms 112 and another, that's another chapter that I would, or another Psalm that I would go and look at uh, this week, Psalm 112, and read all through that. It is all about generosity. It is all about the benefits of generosity. It is about the superpower of generosity. So make a, make a note just to read Psalms 112 during your, your quiet time this week. Uh, how it blesses you, the giver, not just the recipient, but it will also bless you. A couple more verses from the psalm that Paul quoted there. I want to share verses 5 and 7. It says, Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. They will have no fear of bad news. Isn't that true? Wouldn't that be great to have no fear of bad news? Uh, research shows and the Bible says that generous people tend to be more confident about the future. They've learned from their own experience that whatever, whenever they're in need, God provides. Their needs are provided for. Uh, and that is one thing that my mother has always said to me. You know, there were times when things were lean, but God always provided exactly what we needed. Uh, from your personal experience, you know that God has always provided not everything that you want, but everything that you need. That's true. Uh, then I look at, the, uh, look at the next verse there. Paul says... Uh, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I love what John Ortborg says about this verse. He says, when you give, it sets a divine supernatural process in motion that enriches the one who receives and also the one who gives. It enriches not only the people that receive what you give, it enriches you. When people's hearts get captivated, when we get captivated by the desire to give, God enables us to give in ways that are beyond our imagination, that we've never anticipated, and they overflow with joy. Uh, this is what Paul means when he says there in 2 Corinthians 9, 11, you will be enriched in every way, every way. Uh, and then just one more thing. Uh, generosity also, you probably, this is where we began. We're coming kind of full circle to the context here. Uh, it is truly a superpower because generosity also brings reconciliation. It can bring people closer to God. It's why we do what we do as Christian people. It really is. Look at verse 13. Remember the context that we talked about. It says, because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others, the Jewish people in Jerusalem, the other people, will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. And in their prayers, in the Jewish people's prayers, for you, their hearts will go out to you, to you Gentile Christians, because of the surpassing grace that God has given to you. And I love that phrase, their hearts will go out to you. Uh, that is reconciliation right there. This was Paul's end game. Remember, his end game was not to feed the people in Jerusalem. His end game, he thought, was much bigger than that. It was bringing together the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians and to reconcile what was uh, such a divide relationally and spiritually, to bring them together. That is the way, I've told you all before, that is the way that we really increase the reputation of Christianity in America, isn't it? By being generous people. Ongoing acts of generosity, and that's why I love and I constantly, and I know maybe too much to you all, lift up our food pantry to you all, because that is an ongoing act of generosity that we have to our community. Small gestures of generosity build great things for the kingdom. Uh, just this past week, I wanted to let you all know, because you've been so supportive of our food pantry, and I don't tell too many food pantry stories, I need to tell more. Uh, but this week, Bruce and Claire Welch, who shopped for our food pantry, came in. They said, we got six half gallons of milk. For 89 cents. We, uh, 89 cents a piece. Now, that's good for a half gallon of milk. 
but we never get milk because it's so perishable. But he said this time it had 10 days to the date of, you know, best used date or whatever. And he said we knew that we could probably, we'll, we'll give away six uh, half gallons of the milk. I said, Bruce and Clay, I, I said, I'm sure we will. That's neat. About an hour and a half to two hours later, we had the doorbell ring. Somebody walked in for the food pantry. I get to see these blessings all the time. I walked in and I said, I've got a half a gallon of milk. Would you, could you use a half a gallon of milk? The old lady began to tear up. And she said, milk? You've got milk? I would love to have a half a gallon of milk. And I was so thankful that Bruce and Claire that listened to what God put on their heart to go ahead and pick up that milk. First time we've ever had milk in the food pantry. And that lady was so excited to get a half a gallon of milk. And I told Bruce and Claire, I'm so thankful you listened to God and you're obedient to God because you just made a lady's day. I told that lady, I said, you're not going to believe this, but that milk just came in a couple of hours ago. And we usually don't carry milk. Uh, but our people that shop for our food pantry said somebody, God put it on their heart to get that milk today. And I said, God cares so much about you that he talked to Bruce and Claire about you and to go and get that milk for you. And because of your generosity and continued generosity of the food pantry, we were able to do little stuff like that, little acts of generosity. Uh, I mean, we're giving away chicken breast now. We're giving away pork now. We're giving away a pound of hamburger meat. We give away meat where most food pantries just give canned goods. We give bread, fresh eggs. Some of you all this week, out of your generosity, brought in fresh eggs from your chicken. Farm fresh eggs. I can't tell you how excited people are when they realize they're getting farm fresh eggs. Uh, it makes their day, folks. Your little acts of generosity lead people, help lead people to the saving knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ in this place. So don't ever think that your $5 that you put in the plate or whatever you do or whatever you give or even being out there that sometimes your acts of generosity just out at Walmart or wherever you are don't bring about godly change in people's lives and let people know that God loves them. Generosity has an opportunity to do that and to break down walls as never before. That is what Paul is getting at here. That is what he's getting at between the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and the Corinthian Gentile Christians. The barriers are broken down. This last thing, and we'll close with this. It's a quote I love. I've given it to you before from the Roman Emperor Julian. Very anti-Christian, really tried to wipe out Christianity off the face of the earth. He wrote a letter to a friend where he expressed his frustrations. The more he tried to destroy the Christians, the more they grew. Uh, and he had a great quote. Uh, he, he said this. He said, the impious Galileans support not only their poor, but ours as well. They didn't care whether they were helping Christians or whether they were helping heathens, Romans or Jews. We call it grace. Julian was frustrated with it, but that is grace. This is how then and now I think Christians can regain credibility and goodwill. Our generosity in our community through the things we do, like our food pantry and the Bethlehem house, it's part of our DNA, and it provides not only assistance, but it also provides reconciliation and bridge building. It is what we do. It is who we are. And then I want to just land the plane. Here we are coming in for the landing. One verse, I can't leave without this verse out of chapter 9, verse 15. I'm not going to say anything about it, but this is all I have to say. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Loving God, as we close this time, we're thankful, Lord, that you've been so generous with us. Oh, my gosh, Lord, what you have blessed us with in so many ways. We're thankful, and we come as thankful people, realizing we don't deserve an iota of your grace. But, Lord, you've extended it to us over and over again in so many ways. We come with thankful hearts. So this morning, Lord, help us to be grace-motivated, knowing that without a doubt what we have received from you is a free gift. Help us to leave this place this morning to be exactly the same to be freed, Lord, from the bondage of, of things, and instead, Lord, to know without a shadow of a doubt that you've provided for us and that we can help provide for others in so many different ways. Give us eyes to see the opportunities that are before us this week uh, and the opportunities that we have to be the hands and the feet and to share the love of Christ, whatever we do, wherever we go. 
we give you praise for the indescribable gift of your grace and of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. I'm going to have you sing. I'm going to give you the benediction. You can leave here and I'll just have the praise band sing you, praise band sing you out. How's that? Does that sound good? Let's stand. I'm going to benedict you. Is that right? Benedict you? I'm going to give you the benediction. Let's try that again. Oh, before I go, uh, the Schultzes over here, Wes and Ava and Ella, uh, have joined our church. Raise your hand, gang. Uh, and that's uh, Kyle in January, and the two younger ones are, uh, so they've joined their church. You've got back here, you've got Amy, uh, and you've got Addison, and you've got, let's see, uh, Jaden's not here, is she? Uh, you've got those three that are coming to join our church as well, so more folks, so we're thrilled with that. Uh, we're not going to bring them up front and COVID them, uh, but you can certainly wave to them, say hi to them, practice social distancing as you leave, tell them how thrilled you are to have them as part of our faith family. Uh, Albert, raise your hand again, wave, wave, Addison, Addison, wave, okay, y'all can say hi to them, and there's the Schultzes right here, y'all wave, okay, all right, all right, uh, go with God's grace, may the joy of Christ, quit clapping, uh, go and, <laughs> I, I love you all, you are such wonderful, generous people, God has blessed us so much, and I'm so thankful for you, so go with God's grace, may the joy of Christ fill your hearts today. Go and be the eyes, the hands, the feet, the arms of Christ this week. Amen. Your love is amazing, steady and a change. Your love is a mountain, perfect in my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me.